only have you for, I only have you for about 45 minutes so it's going to be short and sweet um, I don't anticipate any questions during the presentation but if you do have questions or comments feel free to put them in the chat if anything big happens so you know you you stop being able to hear me or uh, I kind of confuse everybody, feel free to unmute and let me know. Uh, I'm fine with that as well. But that being said, my name is Carol Smith. I work with SAISD. I have been in education about 20 years now. I've been the instructional coach here for one of our elementary campuses. I've also been a GT campus instructor. And of course, I've been a classroom teacher. So that's my background where I'm coming from. And what I've chosen today to talk to you about is called student agency tools. Student agency tools are tools to help students become more confident and productive lifelong learners. So the purpose of my presentation today is to provide you with information for practical application in the classroom. I'm just gonna uh, touch on five student agency tools. There's many more. Um, and I'm also going to include at the end of the presentation, some links for uh, technology-based applications as well. But right now I'm just going to go over some broad student agency tools with you today. And here is the link to my presentation. Like I said, you should be able to, let's see here, give me one second. I'm gonna try and put this in the chat real quick. Let's see if I can do that. That way you can have the ability to click on any of the links that I'm gonna be showing you. Okay. Oh, nice. So I'd like to share with you this um, statement. It's called, it says by Margaret Mead. She says, children must be taught how to think, not what to think. And that's basically the bottom line of student agency. So what is student agency? I keep saying that over and over. Student agency relates to the development of an identity and a sense of belonging. When students develop student agency, they rely on motivation, hope, self-efficacy, and a growth mindset to navigate towards well-being. This enables them to act with a sense of purpose, which guides them to flourish and thrive in society. So student agency is really relates to the development of those 21st century skills that we see coming along that we can't even anticipate what some of the jobs are gonna be 10, 20 years from, from now. We, we can't anticipate and know all the knowledge and foundation that our students today are gonna to need to know to be successful in the future. So hence, that's why we need to start thinking more from a standpoint of student agency, instead of that knowledge-based, uh, I give, you get mentality. Here's a little visual of what student or learner agency is. It's having a genuine voice in their assessment of their learning. It's showing and explaining thinking in different ways, deciding how they want to share their learning, growing into the person that they want to be, making genuine decisions, knowing their own strengths and how they can stretch as learners, exploring wonderings, their curiosities, passions within the school day and having questions help to shape their learning. But teachers do that already, don't they? Well, teachers frequently talk about student agency as a choice over assignments such as differentiation, like creating a list of items on a menu. And that is good. That is the, one of the steps. That's one of the little cogs in the wheel. But true student agency is about so much more. So bottom line is how can teachers foster student agency in the classroom? Today, I'm just gonna touch on five examples of student agency tools that you might be able to use in the classroom or you might be able to see in the classroom. 
Um, these are very broad. I chose them because I felt like they were a good foundation to start with. They are, I'm gonna to touch on growth mindset, problem-based learning or PBL, something called genius hour, visible thinking routines, and flow theory. So let's get into it. The first one is called growth mindset. Growth mindset is the belief that anyone can learn new abilities through effort and study. A growth mindset embraces challenges versus the opposite, which is called a fixed mindset, which avoids challenges. A growth mindset persists in obstacles and a fixed mindset gives up easily. A growth mindset will see effort as being necessary in the learning process and a fixed mindset would see it as fruitless or worthless. A growth mindset learns from criticism, whereas a fixed mindset either ignores useful criticism or shuts down. Growth mindset is in, uh, inspired by other successes, whereas a fixed mindset is threatened by the success of others. Here's a short video. We're gonna test this out and see if it works. It's about six minutes, so relax. But I want you to notice the little nuances that this teacher does to create more of a growth mindset in her classroom. How does she push her kids to stretch their learning? Okay. So let me start playing this. Get here. Today we will work harder to get smarter. Growth mindset means believing that your brain has the capacity to grow. My job as a teacher is to teach my students strategies to help them grow their brains. Oh my goodness, way to be so precise and clear. Are we taking away two, one, or eight? Eight. In life, students are going to need to pursue problems, and they're going to need to be developed as problem solvers who know how to encounter a challenge and work through it to persevere to solve it. How many star stickers did Sally have left? Scholars, remind our brains how we solve this. Turn and tell your partner, I solve this problem by... In math, in particular, I'm much more concerned with their ability to make sense of a problem and persevere in solving it than I am in them getting the right answer. How many more do I need to take away? Eight. 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 How do you know? Because it said right there, 248. Today's lesson was a number sense lesson, and students were tasked with subtracting three-digit numbers in story problems. Mathematicians, that problem felt especially challenging, didn't it? Yes! One thing you saw in my class today was my students encounter a challenging problem and really embrace it and get excited. What felt challenging about that, Brenda? I got stuck on the 30 part. I almost normalize that everyone's going to feel stuck, everyone's going to feel challenged by it, so that they can get excited and think about the strategies they can implement to tackle the problem. What can you do when you're feeling stuck? Can I have some help? I'm feeling stuck about taking away two more tents. Way to be specific, Brenda, about how to get help. Justify. I took a jump of two and that got me to 200. Justifying and critiquing is one of the most critical components I can give my students to enable their ability to pursue a challenge. I solved that problem by doing the sticker notation. That means they're explaining their thinking with reasoning and evidence, and they're asking others to explain their thinking as well to better understand. I figured it out by doing uh, one strip. What do you mean one strip? When we are tasked with the ability to express ourselves or articulate our thinking, it really illuminates our understanding or our misunderstanding. So when we're asking students to justify their thinking, explain their thinking, sometimes you can see that there are some gaps or some holes. That makes two. 502. 502. I think you're trying to say 522. When you invite that into a classroom setting, you're allowing for feedback from other scholars to engage in that thinking, whether they're understanding or misunderstanding it. Isabella, why do you disagree with me? 
I disagree with you because we should do a strategy like adding up. I think it really raises the level of rigor in a classroom when students can understand their processing and can also question and understand others. Christian and Sade were having kind of a heated discussion about the most efficient strategy to use to solve this problem. Go ahead, Christian. I took a jump of, of 60. My strategy was? Adding up. What's your question, Sade? Why did you take a jump that will make a friendly number? You know that 60 plus 1 equals 61. I just want to pause and reflect on what's going on here. Already two people have shared out the same strategy, but they did it in a different way. Is there another way you can use the tool? One of the ways I feel like I've made a challenge feel exciting is even just through the strategy wait time. Are these worth the same as this? When I see a student struggling, I really zero in on that and I capitalize on it. I say, oh my goodness, I can really see the wheels in your brain spinning. What tool would help me solve this problem? Is a linking cube the right tool? So think, what may be a better tool to use? Hundreds, tens, and ones. Justify. Because we always have three digit numbers. Great. There's two ones, so I think that's 522. We haven't even found the answer yet, have we? No. How are you feeling? Good. Even though you haven't found the answer? Yeah. Why? Because I'm working so hard. Okay, friends, I'm going to have to stop you. We ran out of time. You were doing so much thinking. Mathematicians. I saw groups talking about different problems. At the green table, we haven't even solved the first problem. But you know what? They looked so happy. Can you tell the class about it? We didn't know how to figure it out, but when it was time to go to lunch, we didn't we didn't um, quit. We, we were happy because we were growing our brain. Those of you at your desk, give a nod if that feels like what you are feeling right now. This process is probably one of the most exciting things I find about being a teacher. She's saying me too. Seeing my students struggle and encounter a challenge and embrace it is something that leaves me with great peace of mind because I know when they leave my classroom, they'll continue to have that growth mindset. They'll carry it on with them as they undoubtedly experience new challenges in life. Sorry, gotta move you guys. All right, so in the chat, if you'd like to make any comments about that teacher, um, they will be saved. And if we have time at the end, we will talk about that. But that's the first one, growth mindset. Um, let's move on. Number two, I'd like to talk a little bit about problem-based learning or PBL. Move you guys out of the way. Problem-based learning is when the teacher acts as a facilitator to provide information for students in order to apply their knowledge to a given problem. Traditional learning included students being told what they needed to know, maybe memorizing it, practicing it, and then a problem would be assigned to illustrate how to use it. Problem-based learning kind of flips it around. We assign the problem first, the students and the teacher work together to identify what they need to know, and then they learn and apply to solve the problem. Okay. Um, there's eight essential elements to problem-based learning. 21st century skills is one of them. What do you need to know? What is the driving question that we'll talk about in a second? Uh, giving them student voice and choice, in-depth inquiry, reflection and revision at the end, audience, they're gonna present their product and then curriculum content. So how would you create a driving PBL question? That's the key to this student agency. One, you wanna use keywords like how, 
what impact, what effect, why, if, etc. You want to ask questions that cannot be answered with a yes or a no or a simple sentence or simply Googled. And number three, you want a question that has no single right answer. Examples, you might ask, what makes a great story? How does an organism structure enable it to survive in its environment? How are patterns, equations, and graphs related? Number three, I'm going to introduce you to Genius Hour. Um, some of you might have already heard of Genius Hour. It's student-driven research project-based learning. So it's project-based learning, but it's student-driven. And it's done at school. We allot one hour a week of class time for this project. And each project includes a student-generated question. Um, again, I'm going to show a short video. This is a lot shorter than the other one, and it's going to touch on what exactly is Genius Hour. If you could learn anything in school, what would you choose? Would you learn about fashion and maybe design a never before seen outfit? Maybe you'd get into art or music or theater. Perhaps you'd start a podcast where you review movies, or maybe you'd do a video series about skateboarding tricks. Maybe you'd get into robotics, or you'd learn how to code, or you would plan to invent something never seen before. Or maybe you'd study sports history and share the stories in your own voice. Would you start a foodie blog? Would you create your own science experiments? Maybe interview an astronaut? Learn how to solve a Rubik's Cube in the fastest way possible? Maybe you would geek out on Minecraft and build an entire civilization. Or you would throw yourself into a series of novels and then create a novel of your own. Maybe you would design something epic with Legos. Or you would solve complex global problems and find ways to serve your community. You are about to get your own Genius Hour. You get to choose the topic based upon your own geeky interests. You get to ask the questions and research the answers. Then, in the end, you will create something that you share with the world. This is a chance to show your genius. So go explore and learn and make something awesome. So I love Genius Hour. Of course, I love it. Um, let me move you guys out of the way. So there's six steps to Genius Hour. Number one you're going to inspire the students. You're gonna share videos, photos of things that inspire you. Um, for example, dog training or crochet or art. Um, there's an endless amount, but something that inspires you so that they can see the passion that comes from their teacher. You're gonna model that. And then step two, you're going to wonder, allow the students to brainstorm about things that they are passionate about. So they can create a wonder page that can be uh, digitally or paper, pencil, colors, crayons, you know, as differentiated as you want to be. And then step three, question. Students must commit to one non-Googleable, and that's actually a word, <laughs> question. For example, a passion project question might be, uh, how has football changed since it started? Could I build the Eiffel Tower out of supplies in a classroom? Um, how was it decided that there should be 12 months in a year? So this is just some questions that were put together by different people. And I've included it in the presentation to kind of give you an idea of what possible non-Googleable questions might be. Once they have their student-driven question, then step four will be to learn. You're gonna help, to, as a teacher, we, we need to facilitate the timeline. We need to help that student see what's the ultimate goal and what are some mini goals that we can do to break it down. And um, this will help them to keep on track and create a completed pr product. Step five, one of the most important steps is sharing. Giving the students choice in how to share. 
Um, this is endless. Um, students usually come up with better ideas than we do, but some examples might be a how-to video, poetry. Step six, reflect. After they've shared and presented, what was something important that they learned from the process? What was something important that the other students learned by being, uh, by having been shared with? So that's Genius Hour. Genius Hour actually came out of uh, Google where they created what's called 20% time. And they allowed their workers to have 20% time to do anything they wanted. And some of the best projects came out of that. So, and I think Pixar did it as well. All right, so we've already talked about growth mindset, problem-based learning. Uh, genius hour. Now we're going to talk about visible thinking routines. Move you guys out of the way. Number four, a visible thinking routine is something intentionally designed. Uh, it's graphic organizers that help to guide the students' thought processes and make learning visible. So I've included this little graphic of all the different visible routines. Um, it's kind of small, but you can see it says, see, think, wonder, zoom in, claim support question. Um, if you click on it, you'll get a link to the actual website that goes over all of those different. And they're broken up in two phases to help you furthermore, further categorize the visible routines. But I'd like to just touch on three examples. Um, the first one is see, think, and wonder. It's nice and big. Hold on. Give me one second to sign in. Sorry about that. OK, so see, think, and wonder is just a visible routine for exploring something, uh, for example, works of art and other interesting things. And the questions we ask are, after we present, the picture, we ask, what do you see? What do you think about it? And what does it make you wonder? So the purpose of this is to encourage students to make careful observations and thoughtful interpretations. It helps to stimulate their curiosity and it sets the stage for inquiry. You can use this when you want students to think about something carefully, um, the way it does something, the way it is. You can use it at the beginning of every new unit to motivate your students or to try it with an object that connects to a topic during the unit of study. And consider using interesting objects near the end of the unit to encourage students to further apply their knowledge. Uh, ask students to make an observation could be artwork, artifact, topic, and follow up what, what they think might be going on or what they think this observation might be. Um, this routine works best when a student responds by using the stems together at the same time. Example, I see, I think, I wonder. So that's called see, think, wonder. Then you've got something called CSI. This is also a visible thinking routine. It's a routine for distilling the essence of ideas non-verbally. So are you reading, listening, or watching? Make note of things that you find interesting, important, or insightful. And when you finish, choose three of these items that most stand out for you. For one of these, choose a color that you feel best represents the essence of that idea. For another, choose a symbol what best represents or captures the essence of that idea. And for the other one, choose an image that you might feel represents or captures the essence. They can work in partners or groups. And this routine asks students to identify and distill the essence of ideas. It can be from reading, watching, listening, or a nonverbal way by using color, symbol, and images. Okay, and there's some ideas on applications, how you can use this. It helps to synthesize the student's thinking. Color, symbol, image. And then the claim support question. I like this one. This is a routine for reasoning with evidence. So, so, so important. So step one, we make a claim about a topic. So we're gonna explain or interpret some aspect of a topic. Step two, you're gonna identify support things you see, feel, and know. 
that support your claim. And step three, you're gonna ask the question related to your claim. What's left hanging? What isn't explained? What new reasons does your claim raise? So this encourages the process of reasoning to help students formulate and interpret something and most importantly, support it with evidence, okay? You can use this with works of art, pieces of text, poems, topics in the curriculum that invite explanation or are open to interpretation. Uh, it can work in individuals, small groups, whole groups. The main thing is that they have to have a claim, they have to have a support, and then you have questions. Okay, so there's some more. So those are just three of the possible visible thinking routines. You'll see that I put on my presentation, you can click here, it's called Project Zero's Thinking Routine Toolbox. Let me move you guys again out of the way. Uh, they're separated into the different categories to help you pick the correct toolbox. But if you click on that, you'll get taken to all of this. So if you wanna synthesize and organize ideas, there's all the visible thinking routines you can, you can use. So there's tons and tons to sort through and use. I challenge you to at least pick one or two and maybe think of an idea, a way that you can use that in your classroom. All right. And I'm at the last one called flow theory. So we've talked a lot. Um, again, make sure if you have any questions or comments, you can put them in the chat. And at the end, I'll spend some time uh, letting people share. Maybe some of the things I've talked about have created questions in your mind that we can address or some nice little things that you've experienced in your own classroom that you'd like to share out. But before we do that, let me touch base on flow theory. Flow theory uh, was first developed by this gentleman. I apologize, I cannot say his name, but I wrote his name up there. And it's the feeling of complete immersion in activity. You might have heard of being in the zone. So that's basically what flow theory is. Okay. And you can boost your students' engagement by training them to be in the flow. Well, how do we get a student to be in the zone? Well, step one, you start with that intrinsic motivation. You've got to tap into that student's inner core. What's going to get them motivated? Step two, embrace that student choice again. And step three, provide that scaffolding, ever so important as teachers that we know where our students are and we help build those scaffolds to take them where they need to be. We wanna try and minimize the distractions and give them tools to monitor their progress. Okay, I'm gonna do a short little snippet video that'll explain the flow theory. This is by a gentleman named John Spencer. Flow theory in less than five minutes, I promise. It was the first game of the 1992 NBA Championship Series. The Portland Trailblazers were pulling ahead of the Chicago Bulls when Phil Jackson called a timeout. Michael Jordan emerged from this timeout with a sense of intense concentration. And though it didn't seem like a big deal at the time, he would then go on in the next 18 minutes to hit six three-pointers. At one point, he looked to the sidelines and shrugged his shoulders, seemingly surprised by his own success. He later described this experience as being in the zone. Now, players in every sport describe this similar experience of being in the zone, where they tune out the crowd and the noise and the distractions and just play at their top performance. But it isn't limited to sports. Artists and authors, musicians, engineers, composers, they all experience this same sense of being in the zone. It's a strange paradox where time seems to stand still and yet it seems to be over in an instant. It feels effortless 
rest even though you're facing an extreme challenge. There's a sense of relaxation, but it's also intense. You seem more present than ever, but you also seem to lose your entire sense of self. You've probably experienced this before when you were so engaged in a task that you lost track of time and place. There's a term for this. It's called being in a state of flow. And if we want students to be fully empowered, to own the creative process, to engage in deep and meaningful work, well, then we need to understand what it means for students to reach this state of flow. Although the idea of flow has existed for thousands of years, flow theory began in the 1970s and 80s when Hungarian psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi became fascinated by artists who were so lost in their creative work that they would lose track of time and even ignore food, water, and sleep. And through his research, he noticed a similar experience with scientists and athletes and authors and all kinds of people who engaged in meaningful work. It was a state of hyper-focus and complete engagement, and he described it as optimal experience. Researchers do not have one single working model for flow theory, but there are a few factors that um, the theorists have described as being vital for achieving the state of flow. Number one, it needs to be a task that you find intrinsically rewarding. You're not going to hit a state of flow while necessarily, you know, mowing the yard or cleaning toilets unless that's your jam. Number two, you need clear goals and a sense of progress. It helps if you are actually setting the goals yourself. Number three, the task needs clear and immediate feedback. You need to know what you're doing and where you're going. Number four, the challenge must match the perceived skills. This requires a sense of personal control or agency over the task. In 1987, uh, researchers published the eight channel model of flow shown here. And notice that if a task is too easy, you might experience apathy or boredom, but if a task seems too hard, you'll be anxious. The goal is to match both the skill level and the task at hand. And number five, it requires intense focus on the present moment. So what does this actually mean for schools? Well, here are a few ideas. Number one, tap into intrinsic motivation. Find tasks that students will want to do rather than tasks that they simply have to do. Number two, embrace student choice and agency. Whenever possible, allow them to own their learning. Number three, provide the right scaffolding so that students can match the challenge level to their ability levels, or at least their perceived ability levels. Number four, minimize distractions so that students can focus on their learning. It helps to change the pacing so that you have fewer tasks and more time to accomplish it. And number five, help students learn to monitor their own progress through metacognition. Teach them to set goals, analyze tasks, figure out what they need to do, make adjustments in the moment, and reflect on their progress at hand. Oops. All right, so that is flow. So real quick, let's review. The five student agency tools we've touched on today that you can start using in your classroom are having one, a growth mindset, Two, engaging problem-based learning. Three, utilizing genius hour. Four, using those visible thinking routine graphic organizers. And five, using flow theory in your classroom. So which one will you choose? I've included the link to all those, um, to all the strategies. This is a link to it's called Inspiring Inquiry, and it goes more in depth into learner agency, um, how students can demonstrate learner agency, the cycle of agency, et cetera. So this is a huge website if you are more, if you're interested in learning more tools other than the five that I've just gone over. Okay. And I've also included um, some links to some technology sites that might help you engage with student agency. Um, there's a site called Breakout EDU. 
It's a gamified growth mindset site. It there, there are some free activities that students can utilize. Um, there's also a subscription. I think it's $99 uh, for the year. Um, but And there's also kits that they'll send you. You can purchase kits, I think, for about 50 some. I think for $179, you can get the platform and the actual kit. And you can create breakout rooms in your classroom. I personally have done it. It's awesome. It's well worth it, but it's it's to each their own. You can definitely check that out. There's a site called Wonderopolis. It's a jumpstart site to critical thinking. It'll give students some ideas about things that they might want to engage in, problem-based learning. Um, there's a site called Texas PSP, another project-based learning site. That one actually has lesson plans and more of a breakdown for the teacher to help set those goals on the timeline. There's Tinkercad, which is a free 3D design site online. So that's really cool. Um, there's something called Camp Wonderopolis, which is more interactive, digitally based, problem-based learning. And then there's some fun stuff like uh, there's an AI drawing game called Quick Draw with Google, where the kids can just actually draw things and the computer tries to guess what they're drawing. There's another one called Pixel Art Maker, where just like it says, you can create pixel art. And then there's other fun stuff like Word It Out, which is where you can create word clouds to present uh, what you wanna share. So those are just a very few sites to get you inspired. There's tons more. I can't possibly put them all, but those are ones that I've had personal experience with that I would recommend. And that is all I have. I very much appreciate every, each and every one of you for joining me today. And I have five minutes left. So if anyone wants to unmute, ask questions, share something, this is the moment. And if not, thank you so much for being part of my presentation today. <laughs>